We're rolling. And then, welcome. Welcome. Oh, sweet thing. Are you new? Look at the camera. Um, we have with us today Ben and Ben. Do you want to <laughs> tell us who you are and like where you work? I'm Ben Langzon, and I work uh, at a, a crypto startup called Zero X. Do engineering there. Hi, I'm Ben Yoshiwara. Um, I work at a startup called Artblocks um, that is a platform for generative art NFTs. Awesome. I don't know, like, I feel like my gaze is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, can you explain to the people and to us what an NFT is? Hit him, Ben. Sure. <laughs> uh, so, an NFT, what are they? No, okay, no, no. NFTs are non fungible tokens. Now, I think what that actually means, uh, like by a strict definition, is that each token here is like unique and non fungible, meaning you can't, like with normal currency, like the dollar or Bitcoin, they're fungible because one Bitcoin is equivalent to any other one Bitcoin. Whereas with NFTs, uh, they are all unique, so one NFT is never really, in most cases, um, the same as another NFT. They're completely unique and separate. Uh, in simplest terms, what NFTs really are is any kind of media that's uh, living on the blockchain um, and enabled by a lot of the utility that the blockchain has. Mm -hmm. Can you tell people about the blockchain? Sure. The blockchain... <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. In simplest terms, I think the blockchain is an immutable decentralized ledger. Now, what does that really mean? Like, a ledger is just, you can think of it as a database. And in this case, it's a database that nobody owns, um, anybody can write to, and it's uh, kind of decentralized and censorship resistant. Decentralized meaning it lives on like a lot of different people's computers at the same time. So it would be very hard to get at all of those computers at once and change them and make everyone agree that that's the new thing. The main utility of a blockchain is that it allows you to see publicly everything in a database in a secure way. Um, so part of that is knowing like a history of transactions. So you understand that somebody has this amount of currency in, in the case of cryptocurrency because you can see where that currency, the currency originated, like when it was initially minted, and then everyone it's been to uh, from that point. And you can verify that through the public blockchain. And then using that same technology, you can attach that same utility of tracking where something has been to a unique item. And that is what an NFT is. So you're saying the blockchain allows us to Firstly, uh, prove that it's that person's art or whatever it was. Yeah. And then, and then secondly, it allows you to see the history of where it started and maybe the hands that it has passed through, but we are like authenticating that it's the real deal. That's what the blockchain does? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. NFTs allow you to create this token that lives on the blockchain that you can see the transaction history of and you know who's owned it and who created it and prove that um, and attach that to any asset but typically a piece of digital art and that can move them from one person to another and be traded in the same way as traditional art. An NFT is, is an asset that's trackable and provably authentic that lives on the blockchain. Sure. Yeah, so I think like a lot of people that are have not been in this space are like, why would I spend my money to purchase something that is, which is really cool about NFTs, is that it's basically public art. Like, you can view anything for free, and so why would I purchase it? And both of you have a handful of pieces that you bought. Can you talk a little bit about, from your perspective, why you, in, what your incentive is, and why you enjoy it? All right, I'm gonna break it down for you guys. So, <laughs> I've been around a lot. <laughs> you know, I've been on. No, okay, so, okay, I think. My, okay, entities, right? Why would you buy them? No, I'll let this <laughs> From a buyer's perspective, I think what it comes down to is like, um, it's a collectible, so it's no different than that. But I think it's a better collectible, and there's a few reasons for that, right? I think. 
from a buyer's perspective, um, these days, like, there's a generation that's mostly buying digital collectibles. And I think the blockchain and NFTs is right now one of the better mechanisms for uh, collecting digital items. I really do think that, you know, digital collecting was inevitable. And I think that the blockchain and NFTs is sort of one of the outcomes that has happened and like allowed digital collecting to be kind of easier. And I think a lot of the utility um, and functionality that will be developed and is sort of still being developed right now will add to that benefit for the buyer's perspective down the line. You know, aside from the fact that you're, you know, supporting artists, you could do that, you know, traditionally by literally just, you know, sending artists that you follow money, but this is a better model for that. It's uh, a more equitable model for that. And ultimately the technology that's being developed will allow for more utility stuff like like, you know, having an NFT entitles you to do, you know, this and that, whether that's like, you know, going backstage to a concert or like mm -hmm. meeting the artist for like a studio visit. Like there's going to be a lot of stuff that technology will enable collecting to go sort of in a, in a farther, more advanced direction. Mm -hmm. I also think um, it allows you to buy art that you wouldn't previously be able to buy, like specifically, like you said, digital art. Um, there's no marketplace for that currently, or there was not. Um, digital artists would just have to make money essentially by, you know, working for corporations. It's like the main yeah. way that would happen. And so even as even though you're not really getting a physical thing as a buyer, I think there's still a sense of like satisfaction and knowing that you own something. It's a virtual ownership for sure, but <laughs> Um, yeah, in the same way that you could own a cop a print of the Mona Lisa, like it it wouldn't be the same as owning the original. You could have this thing in front of you, so you just have the you have the knowledge that you do own. own, yeah. own this thing. And I think also like again, if you're approaching this as someone who's like, what's NFTs? I don't really get this, and you hear all this, and you're still like, I don't really get this. I think you have to look at it as potentially like a, just a cultural shift. There's clearly, you know, clearly the generation that's like, you know, that are children now, like they're completely comfortable with it. Digital items are like, you know, already a foundational part of their thinking. So I think the way to reframe it is like, yes, this might seem odd to me. Like, you know, why would I ever have a digital piece of art versus an analog piece of art? But that's not the case for kind of like, Future, right. And just on that note, like, you know, in general, trends seem to be going towards more and more things are digital. So creating a digital identity, including what you own, mm -hmm. is like, will become more and more relevant. Right. Yeah. People are prideful of their pieces. They put them as their icons on Twitter. They just, they have, they can display their pieces. They're very yeah. proud of their collections and they publicize it. And, um, and also I think what what you said about supporting an artist it, it is a really interesting way to say you're in, you're truly investing in the sense that you're like if i i think this person is going to be relevant so i'm going to pay four hundred dollars for this thing because i really think that this is going to be worth ten thousand dollars at some point or that i'll be able to sell it for much more it'll be more yeah. valuable and that is something that like is just not present in dance at least very much because people don't in invest as much as they donate and i think mm -hmm. that that's what's so cool about this model for dance artists is that it's an opportunity for people to invest yeah how much of it do you think of as an investment in the way that like you would invest in stocks versus how much of it do you think of it as an investment to, to an artist in specifically like how much are you hoping that what's the percentage uh -huh. of hoping that you're going to get a you know return on your investment versus you're just hoping that you're helping the artist are you asking like us specifically yeah or, yeah i think it's, it's a complicated question yeah. because it's very personal yeah, yeah i think it's totally. very personal and in the nft market as a whole there's definitely a lot of people who are speculators who are purely speculators mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who are their primary support artists and i think there's like a healthy amount of people who are 
somewhere in that yeah. spectrum along, mm-hmm. the, along the middle. I think it's okay to feel both ways and feel like, you know, oh, you know, I want to invest in startups and you are investing on them. And even a speculator is ultimately still yeah. investing. Right. So I think mm-hmm. this is kind of harvesting the good out of, mm-hmm. you know, activity that is, is <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, or yeah. Yeah. speculation, which is something that is inherent to any art market anyway. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So royalties, you <clears throat> it's basically like a huge benefit for what if you're a dancer watching that we sold the piece on Zora. We could determine what percentage of the sale we wanted to get royalties from. And so we chose 15% or something like that. This is for any future sales. For any future sales. So right now, just one person owns it. But if someone buys uh, buys that piece from her, we'll get 15% of the purchase. It's not uncommon at all for your work to resell and then resell again and again. And there's some number that maybe we'll put here or here that is a percentage of how much of NFT sales are actually secondary sales. Um, And that's also where just, I guess, like investing in the space and yourself as an artist can be really beneficial because you are getting royalties. You can get royalties if you choose to and whatever percentage, like, that could end up being really beneficial. We're hoping to do a project with you two, and we could, uh, we could say that each dancer that's involved is getting royal certain percent of royalties for each resale, which again is really unusual unless you're in the commercial dance world. Like to be a concert dancer that's hired for a film project and then potentially receive royalties is amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Long story short, there's something called decentralized autonomous collectives DAOs for short that uh, work in coordination with NFTs or just crypto mini creation, and they allow for these kind of like interesting uh, models of like equitable um, like distribution of profits. Mm-hmm. And what a step can be something like this version of the strategy where like initial funders. Get some kind of reward, whether it's like literally royalties or some kind of benefits of like early access for future work, or literally you can just when you uh, you know when you create an NFT, you can specify royalties for maybe like the various like artists who participated in the production of the work, the musicians, etc. And it's like really easy to do that, mm-hmm. and you of course you could do that in traditional work too, but that requires. A lot more like you have to hire a lawyer, a accountants. Yeah. Like I think the cool thing, and again, it's just the technology enabling this kind of stuff to be easier on a consumer level and just to democratize these things that were more expensive. You could roll your own NFT smart contract, but you don't have to these days. There's platforms like Zora um, Foundation mm-hmm. and stuff like that. We can say that. Yeah. And, and what I mean, technically behind the scenes, what's happening is they have a smart contract that you're just like yeah. using already. Yeah. 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 So we should say what minting is. Minting. 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 <laughs> minting. But what about minting? Minting, in its simplest terms, is just creating the NFT life. Giving birth to it. It's like authenticating it. If minting is, it's is putting it on the blockchain. Okay, let's <laughs> let's do another take. Minting. <laughs> what is minting? Minting is putting your piece of art onto the blockchain and making it forever mm-hmm. in record so that people can look at it. Minting is a transaction on the blockchain, mm-hmm. right? Any transaction on the blockchain requires a transaction fee. So minting costs a certain amount and that is dependent on the current uh, gas prices which impact the transaction fees on the network. And can you just say what a gas pr- what gas is? <sighs> Think of it this way. The blockchain is a highway and every time you want to make a transaction you have to go through a toll booth and you're paying gas uh, <laughs> to that toll booth. 
Let's make sure that transaction is good. And, you know, the gas price is this number that's dependent on how busy the network is. So however much, if, that, if there's a lot of traffic on the highway that is the blockchain, mm -hmm. gas needs to go up. If there's less traffic, it's less congested, gas needs to go down. So, minting is a transaction on the blockchain. Whenever you make a transaction on the blockchain, you're paying a, a fee, um, and that fee is called gas. Um, and that's kind of a colloquial term. But the gas fee is dynamic, and it's based on how congested and how busy the network is. Um, and so depending on how busy the network is, you might be paying more or less uh, for that transaction to us. So who does that gas fee go to? Is it go to a private Good question, company? Ben. <laughs> so, the gas fee actually well that's I think that's I think that's too complicated to get. Into. The important to remember is that these network fees, these gas fees um, that you're paying for, they're not tied to the platform that you're permitting or purchasing this NFT on. It's actually it's, again it's tied to the network. So these fees are going to the blockchain miners who are ultimately uh, doing this computational work to make sure that the blockchain network uh, continues to run and is secure. Mm -hmm. um, and correct. And correct. I put correct this again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, it ensures the stability of that network. So um, it's kind of like, a, again, you can think of it as a public service fee akin to a toll booth. <laughs> Although that's actually wrong because I think technically oh, people right. own the highways. What's <laughs> 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 that food show that people like Brad and who? And bon Appetit had that. When we minted our piece, gas was pretty high, so it was like a hundred dollars. Yeah. And then I, the equivalent of a hundred dollars, I don't know what it was in ETH at that point. And then also we had to pay like seventy dollars to put an asking price. And we could have not put an asking price, but for some reason, uh, it was about seventy dollars. But that was pretty high, I would yeah. say. Like, I don't know if it would be that in six months. Yeah, you know? it's it's completely up to the the current state of the network. And there's a lot of websites. If you just search for like Ethereum gas, there's a lot of websites that will help you estimate. Like, okay, mm -hmm. if I do sort of a basic transaction, what's the the cost? Something to bear in mind, though, is also the, the, the price of the transaction, this gas cost, right? It's not just... Um, constant. It's, well, it's not constant. Yeah, it's not, it's not constant. And it's not, it's not only impacted by how congested the network is. It's also some, some of it is tied to how complex is the transaction you're about to execute. Um, so it's something to bear in mind. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's usually pretty easy to like, estimate around like what you'll be paying for. What can I make into an NFT? I think... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think to some degree you can make anything, right? A lot of the stuff we're seeing is like digital native media. Um, but, you know, you can go as conceptual as you like. You can, you know, uh, like the way I would give an example is like you can take a video of a dance, but you can also write out all the steps of that dance and potentially sell that as an NFT so it could be as conceptual mm -hmm. or as literal as you'd like it to be. You can also, again, because you can include anything in the description or how the rights should work, like people who sell physical artworks will sometimes attach that to an NFT. And then it's just a clear way of providing, you know, authentication of like this, this is the real yeah. version. And like in the description, it'll be like, if you sell this, you have to send the physical uh, print along with this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's lots of like things that you could try to translate to dance or that are just, you can basically sell it, like you said, anything is an NFT and there are things like the, I made a, uh, an IRL painting. I took a high qual photo of it, sold that as an NFT. Once it's sold, I'm going to burn the painting. That's yeah. happened, I think, multiple times. Yeah. Um, or, or something like bundling like you're saying, that you can attach anything else to it. Like when we sold ours, we included a 30 minute Zoom session where the person who bought it could learn the piece. And so, and that was just written in the description that's not in the smart contract. Yeah. Um, so 
there's the digital asset that you're selling, which is mostly pictures, video, but you could include other elements sure. in the selling of it. Yeah, copyright. Copyright. So I think a lot of questions that we've gotten, especially from dancers, is it, will someone actually like own my choreography now? And just issues about uh, copyright and, and ownership. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I just would say, I would say it's akin to a traditional license that you would give out now if you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, produce any media. Like if you guys, obviously, when you produce something on Patreon or something, you're kind of like, there is a legal, legal stuff going on, but at the same time, you're kind of assuming someone won't go and like, you know, uh, capture it themselves and then like send it out to a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. And if that did happen, you would go to a, you know, civil court or something like that. And, 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 and probably it would go in your favor and the same thing I think would be the case for uh, an NFT. If you bought, like you have a painting on that wall there, right? If the artist was still alive, they would probably take legal action on you if, if, you, if, you, started, if you started doing like a poster on them, doing the same thing. So I would say it's, right. it's the same thing. And, and, and just like in the traditional world, you have that one of one, so you can't reproduce it and do a poster on it, but you can trade to another collector that one of one thing right, you have. Right. Um, yeah, it's kind of this uh, idea of ownership of something that doesn't exist in our physical hands feels also confusing to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, how um, is there a way that you can explain how ownership exists in a digital space that maybe makes that more understandable? Like, the way musicians have like masters and somebody owns the master, usually the musician or the record company. And then obviously, um, they're also allowing people to distribute that on like a larger scale where people are, you know, so I think you can maybe look at it like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like that there's the master, which is this one of one and, you know, and then still people are paying them to get the licensing to distribute. It's not like people are going out there like, yes, you have musical piracy and, and part of the reason why that's success, successful um, is because the digital world makes that kind of thing simple, but that doesn't change the fact that the ownership, the true ownership lies in having the master copy. Mm -hmm. and I think this is maybe yeah. somewhat similar. Yeah, totally. Although, <laughs> I mean, I think the money's the water a little bit because we just went through how like it's not owning an NFT, it's not owning distribution or any sorts of rights. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so right, so, <laughs> it's well, like, and what I'm gonna say, oh, I guess, it's not something that's like enforced at a programmatic level on the blockchain, but it's something that you could still, you know, go to a civil court and, you know, yeah. similar so, to how like, you know, downloading MP3s is on the web, you know, it's not like something that's like automatically enforced, you're going to be taken yeah. to court. Yeah. yeah, I have a question oh. on that. So if someone watching wants to make, wants to mint an NFT and they are, they want to make sure they outline in a written contract that you you can't uh, you know sell this video copies of this video or and you don't own this piece of choreography all you can do is view it and resell it on like legally where is that a written contract where where could they include that do they even need to do that so, so, I mean, I think typically this exists as, like, it can either exist completely off-chain, so, like, if, you know, you just say on whatever platform, like, this NFT is associated with this written, like, license, and that's just enforced however legally. In the or, description? The, the yeah, in the description. In the description. It can be stored in, like, a database of whatever the company is. But I think, I'm not actually sure, but, like, at least the company that I work at, um, like when you release a project through the platform, you can specify a license and that license is then stored on the blockchain. So then like with the NFT itself, you can look up like, okay, what is the license associated with this? And it won't be the whole license. It'll be, again, be a pointer to the license, but then, you know, maintained through history with this NFT will be how it's intended to be owned and what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. And so you can be, do whatever with that, like mm -hmm. you could potentially say, yes, you can redistribute this mm -hmm. in that license. Yeah. And I'd add though that like, again, although the smart contract can't enforce that, I'd say the benefit again of having that license on chain is that 
uh, it's, you know, like, n not just anybody can go around and change that or, like, confuse the money to water, so to speak, if there is a legal dispute. So, you know, I'd still say that's a benefit. But at the end of the day, it's, like, it's still pretty similar to how you would handle licensing mm -hmm. yeah. and copywriting in the traditional mm -hmm. world. Yeah. I think something important to say is that if the piece of choreo that we sold, we can, they, we can do that choreo at any time yeah. for however long we want for the rest of our lives and may still make money off of it. We didn't give away that piece of choreography for forever. And, but if we wanted to, if that was something we wanted to do, we could write up our own contract that says, and like we could sell a piece to a dance company mm -hmm. through an NFT and say, you own this, mm -hmm. we can't ever do it again. So you could specify those things, but like if you're just going on Zora or uh, like OpenSea or whatever, it's not um, inherent in their oh, that website smart contract that you're just giving away full rights. Yeah. People have questions about like, uh, wearing like branded stuff or mm -hmm. even like especially because for dance there's a lot of music and when you're a choreographer or a dancer you so often will use music that you haven't uh, gotten the rights to because we're making like no money off of it and no one's going to see it or very few people and no one's going to take legal action probably but uh, and there like you said with the other copywriting stuff it's almost like it's early enough that we don't have examples of legal action being taken in this regard, that at least that we know of, I think. But uh, would it be your recommendation that uh, people, dancers, don't use a Jay-Z song for their piece, for their piece, and why? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say it's exactly like, literally what you said right now, right? Like, we're, like yes, you can take that chance, right? But I mean, again, that's a chance and that's up to your own discretion, but ultimately, you know, it's, it's not like legally okay to do that. And, mm -hmm. you know, if I would say that, you know, if you, um, if you're concerned about that, you probably shouldn't do it. Also, I think it's even slightly more of an issue because you're making this thing an asset that can be sold and is a, yeah. there's a clear path of how you can make money off it. So, And I would also add that it's now what you're doing is is going to be logged on this public ledger that is going to be around for a while so almost to the point where if you do something like this it could be looked at years from now and then bring some kind of negative light or like you mm -hmm. know some kind of legal issues yeah so we just uh made made a new work and we had to it was originally to beck song and then we had to buy, like pay for someone to make a new track but then even there was a question that we got from someone about, like, I'm wearing a Vans mm -hmm. jacket. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I feel like that seems fine. It's a little bit obscure. Maybe you don't see the label that clearly. But if I was making stuff in the future, I feel like I would probably not have just like a Nike swoosh. Mm -hmm. I would try to avoid that yeah. just for the reason that you said, like, just in case. I don't know. It's, yeah. I think uh, for dance people, it's going to be like a, just a mindset shift of like, well, no one cares what we're doing or knows and we're not making any money. It's like, you have to probably want to be a little more careful. But I think people would also be wondering how much to price their piece at. I mean, I think that's a really, you know, personal one of our questions. If you're looking at it from a perspective of like, I price things one way in the traditional, like physical art world, and how do I translate that to the digital art world? I would say definitely don't sell yourself short. Like, you know, price things at least, at least this, at the same value. You know, I, don't, I think there, a lot of artists have this kind of misconception. They're like, oh, you know, I'm putting in the digital, you know, realm, it kind of like cheapens the work. I think that, you know, obviously it's a personal choice, but I think that's like a wrong way to think about it. It does become difficult, like, to know how to price yourself because if, if you're not in the space yet, we I feel like we really struggled, but one thing I would say is you can always, uh, you both helped us out with uh, putting a list price. Um, so we had an asking price and then uh, someone bid slightly under it and we could still take 
we could still take that money. We still accepted yeah. the bid. So it's not like if you, for most of the platforms, I think, if you have put an asking price of 0.2 ETH, which I think at the time that we minted it was like $350, um, it doesn't mean that if that someone can't then bid on it for slightly less and then you can accept it. So if you want to make an NFT, you want to get involved, you want to buy, what are the first steps to get started? Okay, I get it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. yeah, okay, so I mean, first I'd premise this with saying that I think, you know, uh, I think it's a lot easier to come to an angle of, of first trying to buy an NFT before minting NFT because you'll go through a lot of the same steps, but it's kind of an easier flow. But um, in general, like the way you want to start this is you want to have your own ERC20 wallet set up. All that means is like it's a wallet that can be used on the Ethereum network to transact on it, to, to buy mint NFTs, as well as a variety of other actions. Um, to fund that wallet, you though initially need to uh, buy crypto in one of the centralized exchanges. Um, a common one is Coinbase. So you go to Coinbase, connect your bank account or your credit card, you buy Ethereum, and so now you have Ethereum crypto on your uh, Coinbase account in this example. And then you'd send that Ethereum to your ERC20, personal ERC20 wallet. And then once you have that wallet funded with Ethereum, you can then you know, buy NFTs, mint NFTs. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so the Coinbase account is honestly the only thing that will be interfacing directly with your bank account or your credit card. Um, and then the, the ERC20 wallet um, will be uh, responsible for actually making transactions on the Ethereum blockchain. In terms of ERC20 wallets, you know, there's a couple options and uh, we'll link some below, but one of the most common ones is, is MetaMask um, and it's, it's super simple to, uh, to set up. So. You talk about getting paid and converting your ETH, which is what you'd probably be paid in most likely to dollars. A lot of these platforms now you can set like other currencies in the ETH. Mm -hmm. So I would say, yeah. um, if you can and you're an artist and you're like, you don't really want to be participating in the kind of speculation of cryptocurrency at all, like you're here just to, you know, sell your art on these platforms, there are, some of these platforms allow you to set like currencies such as like USDC, which is a, a stable uh, digital currency pegged to the dollar. Mm -hmm. um, so then you can be like, okay, I made this much money, I don't have to worry about the fact that it might be you know, a few hundred dollars more tomorrow or less, like, but you know, that's something that's a personal choice, but obviously, um, like generally speaking, you'll set uh, a price in a currency that you want. A lot of times you guys are right, it'll be ETH. Um, the sale will happen, it'll, you'll receive the funds in your wallet. And I think a common um, way to then get that money in fiat or like just physical, cash dollars is to transfer that from your wallet to like uh, Coinbase is a big one um, and then Coinbase lets you deposit that into your bank account. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bear in mind, you know, if you're accepting payments of cryptocurrency, cryptocurrencies in general are volatile. Um, so if, you, if you're if you worried about that volatility, the best bet would be to like, to transfer that like same day to your mm -hmm to your Coinbase wallet, it's not, not just Coinbase, no, not but any any big uh, crypto exchange, and I think the biggest ones right now are Coinbase, Binance, um, and uh, Bitfinex. Um, basically any of these exchanges that let you connect your, your bank account to them will accept crypto transfers from your wallet, and then you transfer the funds you received for getting payment for the piece you sold from your wallet to the exchange and then from the exchange to your bank account. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between some of the websites? Probably the, the, some of the more well-known ones are like OpenSea, Rarible, Foundation, and Super Rare, and Maker's Place. <laughs> high level, but, okay. Uh, yeah, but high level, like the, the main thing that differentiates one from the other is that there's some that are curated and some that are open to everyone. So OpenSea and Rarible are both open to anyone. Anyone can go on, use their contract, and uh, mint an NFT. 
um, Foundation and Super Rare and Maker's Place are all uh, places where you need to receive an invitation to uh, to to join that platform. Yeah. Once you're accepted um, and in your and you're a member of the site, you can mint works at any time. They're not like they're not curating your actual output. Uh, you become like a member by getting an invite from someone else that has yes. been on the site or okay. been accepted to the site. Do you believe no, so? I don't at least for foundation, yeah, that's the case. I think yeah. Super Rare is like Super they just Rare, have... and I think Makerspace might still have an application. Okay. Mm. I think Foundation does not have an application. You just have to get invited. Um... So, but for OpenSea, you don't have to mint your work to get it on the site. So, you, if you're worried about money or you're just starting out and you're like, I have no idea who would possibly buy this, you could go on OpenSea post it without paying, and then if someone buys it, then you pay uh, for gas to, to get it minted. Yeah, it's called lazy minting, so it, it's not actually put onto the blockchain until somebody mm -hmm. has, has bought it. Okay, so you, you're someone who now wants to mint a piece, you've made, you made a Coinbase account, you have your MetaMask, you, are, you have your piece that you've made, um, and you've decided I wanna mint it on on uh, Zora, then what are some other things that people could do to integrate themselves more in the community and like learn learn about the community more? Almost all of the community lives on Twitter, Discord, and Telegram. Um, so yeah, I think almost every like major platform and a lots of smaller new projects will create a discord and they're very active i think specifically the company i work for art blocks the community i think is one of the biggest draws um it might be extra exaggerated because i think it involves a lot of people who are early crypto and like nft adopters but it, people get excited about the collectible aspects and in different parts of the project and so it's a place where people go and discuss what they're excited about um, I think that's that's really important I think people in the crypto community want to buy from people who they perceive as you know actually understanding what's going on in the space and yeah. I think the cool thing is that a lot of these platforms uh, really do spend uh, time money and effort on investing back into these communities, like they, I think, are aware of some of the pain points that people have had traditionally with this kind of uh, gallery curator buyer experience. And I, I do think they, you know, they are not resting on their laurels of, you know, all this hype and they just made a ton of money. I think they are investing a lot of that back into the community. Like it's obviously still very early, you know, right? Like NFT is mostly digital artists and so the community community demographics currently re reflect that right now. Right. It's mostly uh, digital like artists in terms of like painting and like stuff like that in 3D art. Um, but I will say there's no reason that that will be the case like moving forward. And I think something that should encourage a lot of people is that you can be sort of, um, you can be early in the foundational part of these new communities forming mm -hmm. around kind of this technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you would recommend people get on Twitter. If yeah, promote, if that's where you need to promote your work more than Instagram, probably. I would say point. though there are people promoting their work on Instagram, so I would say do you know I would say do as much promote cross promotion as you feel comfortable with. But yes, like Twitter, for for people who are especially people who are investing, investing and speculating and on the technology side, a lot of the conversations happening on, on Twitter. But I, I personally, my opinion is that I don't think it'll be too long be, before that actually equalizes. And we do see a lot of chatter flowing over into, you know, Instagram. Like, what do you say to people who are like, but this is kind of expensive? That's a good point, Gracie. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. That's a good point. Uh, on one hand, no. Good point. Okay. Good point, Gracie. <laughs> So on one hand, something to look forward to is that uh, Ethereum is making a lot of changes in the network in the next few months to a year that will um, improve the scalability of the network, which will consequently um, improve 
some of the uh, factors that determine um, gas prices. Um, on the other hand, uh, it totally makes sense that you know people want affordable minting and affordable transactions now, and there are a lot of um, other blockchains that you can explore uh, that do have a lot cheaper transaction fees. One of the ones that you know uh, we know about is, is Tezos. Um, another one is is Polygon, formerly known as Matic. Uh, but again, I would I would say that much of the activity. Um, for better or for worse, is on the Ethereum blockchain. So I would consider that aspect of it, and I would just you know do your own research in terms of like the the, the pros and cons um, when using those chains. But I will say yes, there is cheaper alternatives out there, mm -hmm. and then in terms of Ethereum, there are steps being made to also uh, improve that situation. Mm -hmm. Like lastly, for me, I think uh, people have questions surrounding envi environmental impact, which I know is like a constantly evolving uh, issue and topic. And should we just link some stuff down below that people can yeah. read up on? We yeah. can like briefly say like, the environmental concerns are definitely warranted and it's something that people on the technology side are you know 100% focused on working on that, mitigating that, improving that. Um, something to specifically talk about is that Ethereum, um, kind of like Bitcoin, Right now, uh, it works via this concept called proof of work, um, and proof of work is not very environmentally uh, friendly at its core. Although a lot of the energy being used for proof of work is, is renewable that energy, it can still be improved. Um, and something that the Ethereum team is working on that should be released within the scheme of like a year or two is uh, the next version of Ethereum two, which uses a system called proof of stake. And it's um, a lot less dependent on like environment resources and should mitigate the issue. Um, and then in the meantime, I would again suggest people look at other chains that we've mentioned like mm -hmm. Tezos and, and, and Polygon if, if that is something that is an immediate concern. You know, we're giving you kind of a layman's overview, but you should really, ultimately this is a personal decision and you should read mm -hmm. into the research. It's like a hotly debated topic. Even just the understanding of like what Ben was saying, like the understanding of like, you know, like even like the um, translation of like I invented something. What does that actually translate into like environmental impact? It's not a clear cut answer. It's not like, you know, yeah. so that's something people should look into, uh, and ultimately make their their own uh, choice. Any last things that you feel like you want to say? What is an NFT? Should we say bye and happy minting? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks for being here and answering all of our questions and other people's questions. Bye and happy minting. Bye <laughs> and happy minting. <laughs>